These are the faces of the men convicted of Britain's worst ever terrorist attack, the Birmingham pub bombings in 1974, in which 21 people died. These are the faces of the same men after 16 years of wrongful imprisonment, the gravest miscarriage of justice in living memory. Tonight, they tell their story in their own words. Now, I know that no system of law in this world is perfect, and obviously uh, they can make mistakes. What rankles in our case that it took so long, 16 years? they have known for a long, long time that we were innocent. They could pay me 20 million pounds, wouldn't compensate me for what they've done, for what 16 years in prison. Look, I'll say this, prison can make people very bitter, but I'm not bitter man, because I couldn't love the bitterness because the way I look at it is, if you're going to be bitter, it will make you ill. And you get obsessed with it, like, no. No one can compensate someone for 16 years. It's impossible. My oldest daughter was eight years of, eight years of age when I came into prison. She has children. My daughters have children. As old as they were. The people that don't know those bombings, they've got, to be, they've got to live this the rest of their life in their conscience. It's not in my conscience. I feel fairly sad for the people of Birmingham, especially those who lost loved ones. But we also, done 16 and a half years also, and we lost loved ones for 16 and a half years. I was on a train one night, and I got off it, and suddenly I'm plucked out of space, and I'm thrown into another world for 16 and a half years. Then all of a sudden I'm plucked back out of that world and thrown back on the street. Nothing said to me, you know, they just threw us out like that, even though they knew we were innocent. I did respect the police, you know, I respected them for what they were doing. I'd never known the police to be doing anything wrong, like, you know. I never thought that the police would do Actually, what they did to us, like, you know, I could never envisage that type of thing happening. He's got, yeah, he's got a... The release of the six men has led to a royal commission to investigate the criminal justice system in this country. It has also brought calls for the resignation of the Lord Chief Justice, Lord Lane, who refused an earlier appeal. In November 1974, IRA man James McDade died while planting a bomb in Coventry. His body was flown back to Ireland for an IRA funeral. Some of the six knew McDade. I when I finished work, I went into the public house, and Jerry said to me, did you see the television? I said, no. He said, James McDade's dead. I said, you're joking, how did it happen to him? He said, let's see that, and he says, it's on the telly, he was blowing up. That was the first time we realised that James McDade was a member of the IRA. I'd known McDade quite well, actually, and uh, I'd known him in Belfast as a, as a kid, and in Birmingham when he came. And in fact, him, before he married his wife, like, uh, they used to babysit for us, for me and my wife. The police put this over like that, you know, they, they tried to give the image that we were constantly in touch with my date or constantly uh, associating with them all the time, which was not true at all. I had met this kid a couple of times. I'd heard him singing, uh, dances and things like that. Uh, I never really got to know him, you know. I knew his father fairly well, and I knew his mother a bit, like in Belfast. Five of the men decided to go to Belfast for McDade's funeral. They left from New Street Station. You pay respect to James. But you're also giving respect to his family. It's support, support of the family. And as Jerry Hunter and Dickie and Patty, they were personal friends, so we were actually paying respect to the family. And that's, what's, that's why we go to, we, like, like Brain Our Dead, that's why we do things like that. And always have and always will. I thought I could use the same opportunity to see my mother. I could spend Friday, Saturday there in my own home with my mother and come back Saturday night, like, you know. At the station, the five were joined by Hugh Callahan for a drink in the bar. Well, I went to the railway station. Uh, well, uh, it wasn't my intention. I had no intention of going to go uh, into the station. It just come on in the spur of the moment. As I say, I could have uh, 
I say I got off the bus and he's just as he's went home. The other five caught the boat train. The police later portrayed them as IRA men fleeing after planting the bombs. This is an IRA gang. We had to borrow the money. Look at the IRA that's been in this country. Compare us with them. No way, we're like the Guildford Four. Us, we were just basic working class men and our interest was only, uh, we used to go down to the boozer, have a drink. We had got return tickets. Well, it's a number of us had, three of us had return tickets and the other two had singles. Um, we'd all left families back in, uh, in Birmingham. As the men travelled to the Lancashire port of Hesham, the bombs went off in Birmingham. When the five arrived, the police were checking everyone leaving for Belfast. We were asked to hang on for a minute on the quayside. We were free to go if we wished. We could have walked on up the gangplank onto the boat. But we, hang, we hung about because he had asked us, he says, can you hang on there a minute, lads? This man explained that uh, bombs had exploded in Birmingham pubs and a lot of people were dead. They didn't know how many, like, you know, a lot of people were injured and everything. And, like, we were greatly shocked. So they, then they turned around and says, will you help us in our inquiries? And we said, sir, can we help your inquiries? They took us down to Markham Police Station. We took us down to Markham. Nobody ever charged us. We just helped them in inquiries. They had phoned back to Birmingham, like, we have these five men here traveling to Belfast. Here are all their names, their addresses and everything else. And they actually got word back from the special branch in Birmingham. These men are clean, we have nothing on these men. We know that they're not connected with any organizations or everything else. You can let them go. But um, the chief superintendent, I think, in charge of the police station, he asked us if we would uh, hang about a bit and wait for forensic tests. We'd like to do some tests on your hands, uh, chemical tests, we said, no. Obviously, we'd, we're only too willing to help you, and uh, that was it. That's yeah. the last we've seen of freedom. Superintendent Reid, mm -hmm. five Irishmen, takes up at the ferry. Morecambe's pulled him in for forensic. At Morecambe Police Station, Home Office scientist Dr. Frank Skuse performed forensic tests on the five men. Officers from Birmingham awaited the results. And he'd start, he says, your nails are so IRA nails. And we didn't know what he was talking about. He said, oh, your nails are short. And he'd swap me hands and we just sat there. We'd done everything they asked to do. We cooperated all the way, 100%. We gave him a cooperation. We never realized we were going to do this to us. I was, uh Facing the office where the, the tests were conducted and I heard an officer, a police officer, I presume it was a Birmingham officer, saying to Paddy Hill, you bastard, you've, you're covered in jelly, you've more on you than Judith Ward. Yeah. And that was it, I heard, a, 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 a Paddy denied it of course. and. Uh, the next thing, there was a scuffle. Well, it sounded like a scuffle. I couldn't see because we were all separated. And uh, I knew then that if they were beating him up, then I was probably next in line. Or maybe we were all going to get it. As I stepped through the door, I was uh, punched in the back of the head and it was shouted at me, you dirty murdering bastard. Did we find jelly on your hands? Words to that effect. That was the first that I learned that they were accusing me of having jelly night on my hands. I thought it was ridiculous. Dr. Skews believed he'd found explosives traces on Power, Hill and possibly Walker. This evidence has since been completely discredited, but that was the information the police had when the interrogations began. In my mind, there was no uh, explosives in my hands at all. Never could be. Yet, here were these coppers behaving like raving lunatics, um, telling me that this doctor had found explosives in my hands. Um, they seemed to believe it. And when I was walking down towards the cell, I never seen the policeman behind me, and he kicked me in the back, and I'm flying into the cell, and he just made a football of me. 
And I was really surprised. They didn't ask me my name or nothing. And they just started to, they started beating me up. He says, my mate's coming in here. He's lost people, relations, and he's bombings, and he is mad. He says, you think I'm bad? Just wait till he comes out. And this guy came in, this guy's six foot six, and he's wearing a size 12 boot, like, you know. And he came charging in, and he kicked me. I'm on this low bench, like, and I'm sitting down. And this guy kicked me right in the chest. And as I walked in the door, I got a punch in the back of the head, and I went flying. And a woman was screaming, don't mark his face, don't mark his face. They were dragging me around the floor by the hair. They were punching me, kicking me. They keep kneeing you up here somewhere so your legs go dead. They sit you on a chair and they come behind you and give you thunderclap treatment. They punch you in the back of the neck. But they make sure everything's down here. I had that treatment from approximately 10 to 9 in the morning until two o'clock when someone opened the door and told him to leave me alone, to cut the noise out. There were some people visiting the police station. Other police officers entered the room, particularly one, and punched me in the side of the head, knocked me off the chair. I was set back up in the chair on a number of occasions. Kept shouting, let us have him. You know, give him to us, give him to us. And then he would leave. They were referred to by them as the heavy mob, you know. If you don't, come clean, we're going to hand you over to this heavy mob. They started beating me straight away, punching me, slapping me, pulling my hair, uh, knocking my head against the wall. And in, in between this, they were accusing me of planting the bombs, and I kept denying it, and they wouldn't accept this for an answer. They wanted a, sta a sane statement from me, admitting my part in the bombings, which I wasn't prepared to give them. They got a blanket over my head and they told me they going to give me a couple of minutes with my maker. The next thing I felt was a gun pushed in my head. And I just heard a bang. I thought, I, when people asked me, what does it sound like? And the only way I could explain it, when you get a biscuit tin, you get a biscuit tin, you slap a biscuit, and that's the sound to me. Well, they thought it was funny. My heart didn't even out of my throat. I nearly died. So they dragged me back up again and they started beating me up again. And somewhere along there, I must have passed out. Because when they come to, there was nobody there. The police soon had a sixth name, that of Hugh Callahan, left back in Birmingham. The police were waiting for him as he returned home. I just turned the key on the door, and as soon as I walked in, the cop would just grab me, put the gun to my head. I got there, and then the family started screaming. You know? I said, I haven't done anything, you know? I said, what's the matter? So you soon know some that effect, like, you know. And uh, took me away and that was it. That evening, the five men were driven down the motorway to Birmingham. Before arriving at Queen's Road Police Station, they say there were more assaults and threats. This treatment was going up the motorway. The one in the front took a gun out. He hit me in the head with it and he put up my mouth. He was wrapping it around my teeth. He'd done this on two occasions. The third occasion, he put up my eye. He pulled the trigger every time. And after the third time, he said it a charmed life. And he said we'd go back to Birmingham. And they told me in the car when they got me back to Birmingham, I was going to sign a confession because it was back on their patch. A number of their threats was that uh, they could either shoot us, take us away, that it could be thrown from a car on the way back to Birmingham, be like putting a gun to the head, that. Uh, the fall would kill you, you know, they could shoot us, say we jumped out of the car and tried to escape. Point was, they could have done it. They also tried to throw me out in the motorway. One of them tried to take the handcuffs off, another one opened the door, and they shouted through the, in through the mic system, Hill's trying to escape, and someone shouted back, shoot the bastard, you've got orders, you're all right. After they got us to Queen's Road Police Station, Took us in, put us in cells, took the handcuffs off us, and I was on my bare feet. And then they started taking the piss because, oh, you were in the British Army, and they made me stand to attention. And then some bloke would come along and say, sit down. I was just sit down, get up, stand the attention, sit down. This went on all night. They threatened me with Alsatian dogs. Uh, they brought the dog into the, into the interview room at one stage. Uh, 
made threats against my family, against me. They kept saying, if you don't sign a statement, we're going to give you worse treatment and we're going to beat you up on that. They, they told me my family was, uh, my home was surrounded by a screaming mob and they were after my wife and children. And if I signed a statement, they would move them to a place of safety. He started cursing and swearing and turned away, fiddling with a gun and he turned back and he said, are you going to sign a statement? It's going to work this time. Well, I was, I was looking at him, watching him, just I'm not answering anything. And he pulled the trigger and this, this thing went off. Uh, my heart went boom and I, and I nearly went through the wall with shock like, you know, like, oh, my God. So he, he says, we'll not miss this time and he's doing it again. And he points it again, are you going to sign this statement? Richard McElkenny's allegations of a mock execution in the police station were turned against him at his trial. He had to be lying, it was said. Police revolvers couldn't fire blanks. Last week, it was revealed that a firearms expert now confirmed that police guns could fire some blanks and that McElkenny had given a plausible account of what would happen. This totally vindicated me. It proved that I had not been a liar all these years and that I had actually been telling the truth. Police photographs taken that weekend indicate the condition of the men within 72 hours of their arrest. The men say they were driven to breaking point. One in particular kept coming in and saying, look, you've done this. You've convinced yourself you haven't. And one, of the, one day it's going to dawn on you that you have done it and you're going to crack up. And for a split second, I, I really believed him. I was saying, well, did I do this? Was I capable of such a, an act? But thankfully, you know, fortunately, uh, I, said, I knew that in myself I, I couldn't do such a thing. I was totally lost. I was totally isolated from everyone I knew. I was totally isolated from the other lads. I didn't know where they were. I didn't know what was happening. You know, I was at the mercy of these people. And what they had done to me, like, you know, the beatings and everything else leading up to the shooting, like, you know, I mean, it, it was something beyond belief, you know. And I, I had just gone. I had, I, you know, I couldn't rationalize anything at this time. Like, the police have always denied that the men were assaulted or abused, though at the men's appeal in 1987, former police officers came forward to support their claims of maltreatment. Four of the six signed confessions. They were taken to the court lockup to appear before magistrates the following morning. This officer was in duty in Steelhouse Lane, the lockup. He, he wouldn't let me sleep that night. He, at one stage, he pulled the gun out. Through, po po poked her through the hatch and threatened to shoot me if I didn't stand up. He had me standing on my tiptoes with my arms outstretched. He said, uh, just like a crucifix, that's it. He says, of course, I'm going to crucify you tonight. And he hung a, a noose outside my cell and had it swinging. The next day, the six were remanded to Birmingham's Winston Green Prison. The mood in the city was ugly. The West Midlands police handed the six men over to prison officers. No one denies that once in jail, they were the victims of vicious assaults. When we pulled in to uh, Winston Green itself, we were in little cu uh, cubicles locked in a police van, and each in turn was the door was opened and literally kicked out of the van. The door opened, stepped out. There's only one way to go. The door closed behind, and a a boot, a foot in the back, flung me forward. The first thing I remember is the police introducing us to the the prison officers, saying. Uh, Here's the, here's the bombers. Uh, a few swear words thrown in, obviously. Uh, this one's the brigadier. This one's the, the captain pointing to me, and the other four were lieutenants. And my head is grabbed from behind and smashed into this wall. Right? And then the whole place just erupted like, you know, and there were screws coming from everywhere. There was mobs of them. And they were running from everywhere. I, 
And we started running, there was screaming and all going on, there was blood calling, coming out from all places. Like, And we were running through whatever opening there was. We didn't know where we were, we didn't know where we were going, we just ran where there was an opening to try and get away from these people. You know, it was horrific, it was totally horrific. These guys had gone mad, totally raving mad, you know, and they were after us, they were battering us, they were kicking us, everything was going on. We were, we were made to face the wall and the blood was running down the walls, our blood, and they kept screaming at us, stop bleeding over our walls, which is impossible. I was facing the wall and I, I couldn't see who they were. The next person that came beside me was Jerry Hunter. And I turned around and said to Jerry, fuck me, Jerry, I said, my teeth are missing. That was the first time I realized my teeth was missing. The men's ordeal was far from over. They were next taken from their cells to the bathhouse. She just didn't know what was happening. Right down the stairs, dumped in the bath. Water is cold and very brown, looked brown anyway, obviously from the blood from the others. And he drops all this hair in on top of me, like, you know, into the water, and he pulled, ripped out of my head, you know. And then he grabs me and he starts pushing me on there. He's going, get the blood off. Get the blood off, you bastard. Get it off. I couldn't get the blood off because it was pouring out. And this guy, he, I told him, maniac, get the blood off, get the blood off. And he shoved me under the water and hauled me under to try and get the blood off. The, the bath is black. It's, it's also red with blood. Hairs floating in it. I was thrown in fully clothed. In fact, me and the prison officer fell over the bath. One of the things I noticed after entering the cell, after having the bath, was that uh, the windows were made of glass. The mirror was made of glass. And uh, it stuck my mind that if the worst came to the worst, that, that here was a way out, you know? At least it crossed my mind the possibility that I may be driven to smash the glass and actually use the cut the wrists. My ears were bleeding for three days from the inside. After this, you know? My eyes were busted above, my head was split, my eyes were busted below, my mouth was busted inside and outside. Oh, what a state, you know. It was horrific, it was totally horrific. I used to lie awake in my cell, in the wing, it's such a small wing, D-wing then, and uh, you could hear the, 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 the prison gates opening. I don't mean the, the main gates, I mean the gates into the wing. And you kept thinking, well, I kept thinking, this is it. They've realised they've made a mistake. I know it was foolish, but I've kept thinking they've made a mistake. They're going to open the doors. They're going to let us out. But uh, it obviously it never happened. And uh, we, we were in a terrible state. It, there's no words to describe it. It lasted to me, it lasted a lifetime then. That's a horrifying experience. I think, parenting speaking myself, if those beatings at Winston Green hadn't lasted, lasted any longer, but some of us would have died. No question about it whatsoever. Prison officers were charged with assaulting the six, but they were all acquitted at trial. These official photographs were taken after the prison assaults. The men's injuries made it impossible to prove whether they'd been beaten earlier by the police. The families of the six were to be shocked by what they saw on their first visit. My missus came up with my second youngest child, and my second youngest baby turned around and started crying. She started saying to her, Mommy, this ain't my daddy. She didn't recognize me. I mean, I, my teeth were all gone. And I was enough of a mess. I was trying to tell him not to worry. I was okay, you know. I, I you know, I couldn't do anything else. Um, and they went like, you know. And I think my mother fainted outside, you know, when I'd gone. Like, you know, uh, you know, it was almost as horrific as getting me actually beaten. It's, seeing my mother and my missus there, you know, my brother, and the shock on their faces, you know, it, it almost gave me a true picture of what it actually looked like, you know. I think the next day they gave us some exercise and I couldn't walk. I couldn't walk at all. And uh, I, I wanted to come in to lie down and said, no, you keep, keep out there. And uh, oh, it, we, we must have been the most hated people in the world. You stand convicted on each of 21 counts. On the clearest and most overwhelming evidence I have ever heard, 
of the crime of murder. In respect of each count, each one of you is now sentenced for life. We were saying like to each other, well, they, they can't get away with this. You know, I mean, this is all lies. Nobody's going to believe this rubbish. And we really thought that at this trial, we would be totally vindicated. Not so. We, we you know, we still hadn't realized the full horror of what had happened in Birmingham because we had not been allowed to, to see this thing. or You know, I'd seen no papers or anything I hadn't, you know. Like we had the forensic, Mr. Scurse, he was 99.9% .9 sure. I mean, who am I to talk against a scientist? Who am I to talk against this policeman? I mean, as the judge says in the trial himself, do you believe these policemen? Or are you to believe these men here? Well, I've just been charged with killing 21 people. Nobody's going to believe me in a million years. So how do they call that justice? I'll never, never know. And that was the most sickening thing about it, because I thought we were going to get justice. We did believe we would we would uh, be uh, acquitted, that things would be put right, that we'd see the mistake they've made. And uh, we challenged the police evidence because we were, they, they tortured us, they mentally and physically, they beat us up. And the judge held a trial within a trial for the first week on the admissibility of the statements. And at the end of the first week, he ruled that they would stand, they would be accepted as evidence. And I think, well, we did know then, from then, that we were going to prison and going to prison for a long time. The men were each given 21 life sentences. There was no indication of when they would be released. My record was stamped that I was never to be released from prison, I was to die behind prison bars. That was stamped in red in my file, that was told me by a governor a number of years ago, and he told me straight, he says, out of the six of you, You'll be very, very lucky to ever get out of jail. And then he told me, he says, in fact, he said it's on the fair, and he told me what it was, you know. Like the cons and all who were in the prisons at that time, they believed that these guys blew up these two bombs with all these young people and all in them. These guys are mass murderers. And these guys hated us. And not alone did they hate us, the screws hated us, everybody hated us. They did. We were attacked in various different prisons. We had to watch our bikes all the time. I had to keep looking over my shoulder. Around seven, seven o'clock, every prisoner gets a cup of tea if he wants. They bring it round the doors, plus a little tea bun. Well, they did then. They used to deliberately leave me the last. And the tea, again, well, which I never drank because then I suspected that, that they may have done something. The tea bun was always wet, damp, as if they'd spat on it or, or urinated on it or something. They would turn my light off. This was in the winter months. My light went off, I think, uh, possibly four o'clock. And I would, I would ring the door, for, uh, the, the pr the press the bell for the, the officer, and I'd say, put, the, the, put my light on, please. And he'd just ignore me. And I would sit there, to, well, all night, in the dark, till I got into bed. I looked at it this way here, I mean. First of all, first and foremost, I thought about my wife, and I said, well, she has to face the whole wide world out there, what she was getting. But I only had the prison population to put up with. And I could sit here for the next 24 hours trying to tell somebody about prison, and at the end of the day, the only thing you're going to know is the word prison, because you can't imagine in your mind what it's like. It's an experience you have to go through, and the experience that we went through, well, me, I hate the bastards to put us in jail, but I wouldn't even wish on them what they put us through. Maybe after the first couple of years were very, very hard. But then, like, well, I was in one prison, Paddy Hill was another one, Jerry was in another one, Sherry was another one. And over a period of years, people come to know us, and they see what kind of people we were, and then they believed. And once you believed in prison, you can't hide nothing in prison and they knew we were 100% innocent in the prison. It took a long time, but we got there.
As the years in prison passed, the threats and violence towards the men died away. But the long sentences and the lack of response to their pleas of innocence placed different pressures on both the men and their families. It's not very nice seeing your own wife, your own children sitting on the other side of a visit room table. You know, and you know, you can't really give them the love they need and that you want to give them, you know. You know, you're being cut off. And you are, you know, and it's as if the system is trying to strangle the love that belongs with a family, you know. They're trying to flatten it. I had five daughters and a son. My son's the youngest. And for me and my wife, our life was complete, like, you know, we were happy. And, uh, well, we're divorced now, as you know. And the rest of my family, well, they all had a terrible bad... All of our families, not just mine, but all of our families had a terrible bad time, you know. And uh, my wife in particular, because my wife was well-known like I was, we used to go out all the time, and everywhere I went, I took her, you know. And uh, my kids are the same. The well known. Thankfully, over the last few years, it's got a bit easier, you know. But what they've gone through in a lot of ways, they've had it worse than what we've had. There ain't no doubt about that. I've never seen my children growing up. What hurts me mostly, it, my boy was getting around that age of 11 years old. I started taking him down to the football to watch the villa. Oh, we weren't doing too well at the time, but uh, we're, we're in the third division. And we just, I was actually getting to grow up with my son, starting to know him. I've lost all that. Now I've got to go, I'm going to go back home now. He's got three children of his own now. And I, I never, I've got to go, I haven't seen two of my grandchildren yet. It's difficult, very difficult to, to conduct a marriage or keep a marriage going under those circumstances. Uh, well, once, twice a month for, for two hours. And to, to see your kids growing up, you know, it's it's uh, hurling, yeah. It's really heartbreaking. It, it took me... Uh, I kept thinking of my children, because they were young when I went in. Uh, my oldest boy, I think it was eight. eight or, yeah, eight, eight, seven and, and six, uh, five, four for my daughter. And even when they were 12 and 14 and 16, I kept thinking of them as young children, not realising that they're, you know, they're growing up now, they're... And it, it took a few years, so maybe eight or nine years before I realised that they're, they're people now, they're individuals in their own right, they're no longer children. It's easier sometimes to suffer yourself than see others suffer, and our families have suffered more than we have. And uh, comparatively speaking, we have suffered a lot less than the families. Sometimes it's easy for us to go on visits. We don't have to be called and walk across, you know, a few minutes. Families have to make plans and, you know, uh, what do you call it, organise, it's a day out, let's put it that way. Sometimes I have to travel miles, sometimes I have to get trains and buses and so on, boats even. Um, it's a long, hard slog for them. I've missed weddings, I've missed birthdays, I've missed Christmases, like, you know, the worst time of the year, like, you know. I miss my girls making their first communion, making their confirmations and everything else, like, you know. All these types of occasions that were usually festive occasions for families, I missed them all. And they missed me, I'd be not being there. Well, I'll tell you when, I'll tell you when, uh, as hard as times, I mean, when they come to visit you and the time goes up and you have to leave, do they have to leave and you go back? And visits, you see, even up to the present day before I come away, can be a very, very emotional thing, right? And when I used to come back, I used to just lie down in my bed, like, and then my head was spinning, like, and all I got there. And of course, when the evening time comes, that's when it all comes in. And the emotions start coming, you know what I mean? Yeah, what you do it there. And uh, that's, 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 that's very, very hard. Very hard to leave. Them. The men's families kept up their campaigning, lobbying, and petitioning. From his prison cell, Paddy Hill wrote letter after letter to anyone he thought could help. I found it very frustrating. Like sometimes, and I'd send out fifty or sixty letters. And within a matter of a few days, the majority would be sent back to me. You know, and the majority of them wouldn't even have been opened. 
And I am not ashamed of him. I used to sit in that prison cell and I used to cry like a child with pure frustration. Not because I wanted anybody to believe I was innocent, because I say I'm innocent. I just wanted someone to sit down and talk to me and tell me what I was doing in jail. Our families, our families are very, very staunch towards it because our families knew from, what, from day one that we'd never done it. How could I speak about our families? They were the backbone of us, they kept us alive. I mean, there's Kathy McKinney, as far as I'm concerned, that's a lady. The day I die, Sandra Hunter, another great woman. In 1985, a World in Action program cast doubt on the forensic results. It was discovered that traces from innocent objects like playing cards could be confused with traces from explosives. The following year, a former policeman came forward and said he'd seen some of the men being ill-treated by West Midlands officers. The Home Secretary referred the case to the Court of Appeal. I know we kept our feet on the floor, but we held a little bit of flame was burning now. Like that this, we always laugh, we would talk about grass growing, it just gets that size and that size, and we were holding that little piece of grass or little twig, and that little twig was getting bigger every year going along. We thought we had a 50-50 chance, and we thought no more. And that is fantastic to tell me by going to the Court of Appeal. As has happened before in references by the Home Secretary to this court, under Section 17 of the Criminal Appeal Act 1968. The longer this hearing has gone on, the more convinced this court has become that the verdict of the jury was correct. We have no doubt that these convictions were both safe and satisfactory. The appeals are dismissed. The longest appeal hearing in history heard evidence supporting the men's claims of ill-treatment and assault and throwing doubts on the forensic results. But the men went back to their cells. I couldn't believe that this actually happened. British Joseph's actually done this to us and he could not take it in and he didn't want to take it in and he was not going to take it in. And he was sending us six back to prison. Once again, we'd been given a knockback. We were beginning to get used to this. We had no illusions about the attitudes of the judges. We had been warned beforehand that they expect anything from these judges. It did go through a bad period, a bad patch. But I'll, uh, to be truthful, uh, we always had something to keep us going. And, but by then, we knew that we were getting near the end because it, even though they'd rejected it, the world was, well, they could say the world, the country, this country in Ireland, People were beginning to set up and take notice of the case and knowing that there was an injustice here and it must be put right. Everybody talks about the Birmingham Six, the Birmingham Six, the Birmingham Six. I'm sick of the Birmingham Six, I am. I want this brand taken off my back. I just want to be me. A startling discovery about the evidence of this man took the case back to the appeal court this month. The credibility of Detective Superintendent George Reed, the central witness as the man who'd led the investigation in 1974, couldn't be relied upon, the prosecution decided police notes had been fabricated. The judges heard that more forensic work had discredited the scientific evidence completely. The six were finally freed. It happened so quickly, like, and it was over in a flash. And we stand up, and uh, as Lord Lloyd says, will the appellants please stand? We stood up, the whole gallery stood up. Everyone in the pack gallery all stood up as well, like, you know, and you could hear somebody saying, sit down, sit down, and not one of them would sit down, and they all stood up with us. And then the place erupted, like, you know. And I was jumping up and down, waving my arms up in the air and shaking my hand. And my daughters, my friends, and all up there, like, you know. It, it became so sudden. We just looked at one another, I think. We just, we just couldn't believe it. It was, it's funny hard, I just, it's like somebody just took a cross off my back. All these years we carried this cross. Here we were, six men branded, and all of a sudden somebody just came along and took this brand off us, or this cross off our shoulders. And, oh, it's just unbelievable, fantastic. It was something out of this world it was, like, you know. And I leaned over the top of the, the dock, and I grabbed a friend of mine, gave her a kiss, and then we were rushed out. And they walk outside, they look up the sky, they see people for the first time. For 16 and a half years, all I ever seen was a wall. 
and they walk outside and see people across the road and people cheering you. <laughs> it, was, it was unbelievable. And it was frightening. I mean, I try to walk up, somebody says, say something to Mike. I walked up to Mike, and I, as soon as I want to open my mouth, no one will come out. I just got a lump in my throat, and I had to walk away. And then my wife ran up to me, and oh, it was fantastic. Great. Oh, yes. Uh, I was, actually, it was, uh, I was dreading coming up from the court, the well of the court, because we, we had known by then that there was hundreds of if not a thousand, two thousand, three thousand 3,000 people outside, plus uh, the world's media. And I remember the, the, the welcome that the Guildford Four got, and I was dreading it, actually. But funny enough, when I come out, that all, all my fears just subsided, uh, and I just joined in the, the celebration. It was really one experience, an experience never to forget. It'll, it'll always be with me, that experience. I'll never forget that day. It, it was it was really brilliant, like, you know. It, it's very hard to describe, like, stepping out into the sunlight and there are no bars and no walls. Around, and there's all these throngs of people all over the place, like, you know, and they're cheering and they're crying and everything else. You know, it was brilliant. Like. When we get in the car, and I said to Richard, I said, you realise it's the first time in 16 and a half years I mean he's been in the car without having handcuffs on. And we just busted out laughing. It was, you know, even now, looking back on it, you know, it just doesn't seem real. Nothing really seems real yet, you know. I don't think it's really sunk in. Somebody opened the door for us and we walked into a garden. And I walked me and Paddy Hill walked up the end of the garden. There's a swing in the garden. Paddy sat on the swing. <laughs> and... Uh, the other lads are standing down the bottom talking. Guess the six of us just standing there talking and brand new fresh air and looking up, darkness first outside in the dark for the first time after all those years. Oh, it was a great, great feeling, fantastic feeling. Just couldn't believe it. For the first time in more than 16 years, the men can look forward to simple pleasures, long denied. When you're in a prison cell, in a maximum security prison, they have uh, very, very bright lights, and uh, you can see the sky. And it was always my wish to walk in the dark to see the night sky. And last night, I got my wish, but there wasn't a star to be seen. <laughs> it was a cloudy night, and but I'm hoping to get it tonight. Well, last night, I we went to the hotel last night, and I put my arm around my youngest baby, and me and her went for a walk. My youngest baby, 18 years old. We just went for a walk. We walked around the corner. Two ducks was there in the quad. <laughs> I nearly died. <laughs> uh, and there was a river and trees hanging there. The atmosphere was fantastic. Oh, it was great. It really was great. The first thing I heard this morning was my mother's voice talking to my grandchildren. It felt really strange, but it was something that I'd been looking forward to. After a little while, well, I was in another room in bed with my son. He was in the other bed beside me, and I got out of bed and went and seen them. And I just can't find words to describe just seeing my family together, you know, inside of this world. Tonight is probably the first time that I've had all of my, more or less all of my family with me. Their release has given the men new opportunities. One of these is to campaign for others who they believe are innocent. Though I had this elation and this euphoric feeling yesterday, it was, a, it was all tinged with a, a little sadness because I'd left, I know the innocent people in prison and I know how they're feeling and they're exactly feeling the same way as us. Happy to see us out, but sad too that it wasn't them. And these men are innocent and they're going to serve long, long time, years in jails, like, you know. They, now some of them spend the rest of their lives in jail if something not done about this, you know. There are lots of other people who are not getting any coverage. They are innocent. Some of them only doing a few years, some of them doing longer. There is no one campaigning for them. They don't have anyone to help them. The Tottenham Three, Bridgewater Four, and a long list of other prisoners who've been asking the same as us. We are going to ask our campaign, the six of us, whatever money's in our campaign, 
We would like to use this money to keep the campaign going. They want to carry our name with it. We'd be very honored and very delighted. We want this campaign to go on for people who are in prison, who are innocent people in prison. Well, in December 1974, it was the debate to bring in the Prevention of Terrorism Act. One of the clauses in that was to bring back hanging for a trial period of 12 months. Had that passed through Parliament, they would have hanged us. Today, people may have been saying that was a judicial murder. Well, since the 60s, uh, there's possibly 22, 23 cases of uh, people who have had their convictions quashed, ourselves included, who, if hanging had been in force, would have, would have been dead. The men now have to face a world which has changed dramatically over the last 16 years. I woke up this morning, I didn't know where I was. <laughs> and uh, I looked up the ceiling and there's was something odd up there. And you mean, this ain't the ceiling, I always keep looking at And then getting out of bed and going over and opening the door and picking up your washing kit, going out of a shave and having a shower. <laughs> Nobody there standing beside you and putting on your clothes. And, uh, I ain't come down here, I'm up there somewhere, I'm just up there. Just up there somewhere. The, the hardest thing for me at the moment is, it's very hard to cope with the present. I don't want to think too much of the future. And the one thing I don't want to do is dwell on the past. That's the hardest thing, not thinking about it, you know. I don't know how I'm going to cope but with the family and all the rest of it, like, you know, well, if I need help, I got all the help I want, you know, professional and family and everything else I want, but how it's going to affect as well. Time only will tell. Well, after 16 years of words, I'm told all of the, a lot of things has changed out there now, and I'm even seeing that with the, the little gadgets and the phones and stuff like that, you know what I mean? There'll be a lot of little things. I'll have to pick them all up again. Well, I'll, I'll cope. I'd only been asleep about an hour and a half or so and I got up and I was sitting there and I was looking at the door, at the handle. And I can't even tell you what I thought because it, mine was blank at the time, you know. I was just sitting there looking at the door with a handle on it that was unbelievable. And just to get up and go over and open it and walk out without having a screw around you or a cup. I can't find words to describe it, I don't know. I, I honestly have no bitterness in me. Thank I do thank God for that. Maybe some anger now and again, yeah. That aspect is um, you're missing your children. They are now, they're conducting lives of their own. They're, they're, they're getting married and obviously they're having children of their own. And as what Johnny Walker says, eh? and Dickie, they're going out now to pick up where they left off with their grandchildren. They, they well, I'll, I'll have that to come, I suppose, but they're carrying on so to speak, but the miss with their children, now they're going to get with their grandchildren. I'm taking great enjoyment in my family, actually, you know. As, you, you know, we've been together since then. And, you know, it, it's so beautiful to be able to turn around and speak to my daughters, put my arms around them, pick up my grandchildren, like, you know, they're running up. You do grow.